In our previous video on the M16 and its introduction to Vietnam, we covered the mistake that Colt made by not using the license process on the bulkier group for the chromium process. But for soldiers and marines, things were about to get much worse. So 1965, we hit a big battle with the M16. It shows its capability and that it is a good weapon. But when exposed to the environment in Southeast Asia, it was extremely humid. Many things would start to go wrong. Reports would be so bad that Congress would launch an investigation into the issues that were plaguing the M16 and much would be turned up not only where Colt made mistakes, but where the DOD made some serious mistakes as well. On Colt's part, chrome lining process in the bulk carrier, and Colt also saw fit to forego chrome lining the barrel and the bore. Now, this was not in the original design specification for the AR-15, but Colt had plenty of experience in making military firearms, and they should have known, and did know, that the chrome process needed to be applied to the bore and the barrel to be used in the human environment for which it was being marketed to be used in Vietnam to the Department of Defense. Colt did play a role in touting the weapon as the self-cleaning uh, rifle that would take care of itself. And that wasn't true. In fact, they convinced the DOD so much that the DOD even told the soldiers in the field it's a self-cleaning rifle. They didn't even issue cleaning kits for the rifle. What? In addition to that, the ammunition was changed from using stick powder to ball powder. The military had plenty of this ball powder left over. The problem was it didn't work well in humid environments and it increased the fouling in the M16. So when soldiers and Marines were using this in the field, the increased fouling mixed with the humid environment caused significant issues with feeding and ejection with the M16. The DOD was also taking these rifles and putting them into the field and giving them soldiers with little to no training. Public outcry was so much that Congress had to act. The first thing they changed was making the powder the right way. They went to a phosphate finish on the bulk carrier group and they chrome lined the bore and the chamber of the rifle and they added the forward assist. Hey, welcome back to Gun Cody, where we're going to dive into the stories behind groundbreaking military innovations. Today, we're exploring the history of one of the most influential firearms in the world, the AK-47, and the story of its creator, Mikhail Klyushchikov. Mikhail Timofeyevich Klyushchikov was born in 1919 in the Soviet Union. His journey into firearms design began not from a lifelong fascination with weapons, but rather from his experiences as a tank mechanic and later as a soldier during World War II. He was wounded in battle in 1941, and Klyushchikov started devising ideas for a new rifle while he was recuperating. His motivation was clear, to develop a reliable, easy to manufacture automatic rifle that would give Soviet soldiers an advantage over their adversaries. Post-war, the Soviet Union sought to modernize its infantry weapons to keep up with the advancements made during the conflict of World War II. Klyushchikov, now working in a small workshop in Izhevsk, took on this challenge with determination. Between 1946 and 1947, he developed a prototype for a new assault rifle that caught the attention of the Soviet military during trials. This rifle was the AK-47, which is an abbreviation for Aftermath Kalishnikova 1947. The AK-47 represented a significant departure from previous rifle designs. It was chambered for the 762 by 39 cartridge, a choice that balanced the need for range and power with manageability. Its design was ingeniously simple, featuring relatively few moving parts and using stamped metal parts for easier mass production. Simplicity made the AK-47 not only reliable in harsh conditions, but also remarkably easy to use and maintain, key factors that would contribute to its widespread adoption. Kushnikov's design philosophy was driven by the need for functionality and reliability. Famously said, a weapon was supposed to be designed so that even a soldier in a state of panic could operate it. The AK-47 lived up to this philosophy. Its durability, combined with the ability to perform in mud, sand, or water, quickly made it a favorite among soldiers. The AK-47 officially entered Soviet military service in 1949 and would go on to become the most widely recognized and prolifically produced firearm in history. Its impact extended far beyond the Soviet Army, influencing armed conflicts around the globe. The rifle's design has been adapted and modified in countless ways, leading to numerous variants such as the AKM, which introduced a lighter build and an improved rate of fire. Mikhail Kalashnikov's legacy is complex. He created a weapon that has been both praised for its engineering excellence and criticized for its role in armed conflicts. Reflecting on his creation, Kalashnikov once expressed mixed feelings Proud of his work as an engineer, but pained by the uses to which his invention had been put. The AK-47 story is not just about the rifle or the man who created it, but the role of innovation in warfare and its profound impact on global history. It demonstrates how necessity, combined with ingenuity, can lead to creations that shape the course of human events. Thank you for joining us as we explore the development of the AK-47 and the life of Mikhail Kalashnikov. This iconic rifle and its creator's story offer deep insights into the intersection of technology, warfare, and history. 
For more insights into the innovations that have defined our world, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell, and we'll see you next time for a new video. And always, always go and sign up for our email newsletter where you're going to get the best deals in shooting sports direct to your email box. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. So, we all know who the designer of the M16 and the AR-10 and those types of rifles was, uh, and that was Eugene Stoner. Uh, what some people haven't seen is a couple of years ago, some tapes came out on YouTube called the Stoner Tapes, talking about Eugene Stoner. So what was really interesting was in one of these interviews, they were talking about how the Ford Assist got onto the M16. And Stoner didn't want to put a Ford Assist on the rifle for reasons that he stated pretty obviously. He said, if there's something wrong where the round is not seating all the way into the chamber and the bolt's not going all the way forward, then you probably shouldn't be forcing it in there. What you should be doing is pulling the bolt to the rear, checking it out, and finding out what the problem is because it's not supposed to do that. But the, the military officer that was in charge of this uh, of the M16 program really wanted a four assist. Uh, and what he did was he took a pair of pliers and he actually bent the cartridge of a 5.56 round. He bent it so far that he had to force the round into battery using the forward assist. And this was the only justification that the Army could come up with to justify having the existence of a forward assist on the M16 rifle. So if you think you need a forward assist on your rifle, eh, probably not. I mean, realistically, the only time I've ever really used one is to do a brass check. Uh, outside of that, I've never really had to, to use one at all. What do you think? Is it a useless feature, the forward assist? Or does it actually serve a practical purpose? Would you use it? in order to force a round into battery? I don't know, I probably probably wouldn't do it. Uh, but I wanna know what you think. What is your take on the forward assist for the M16 and the AR-15 rifle? Is it just five being on there or is it just something we don't need? And as always, make sure that you go over guncoyote.com, sign up for our newsletter, where you're gonna get the best deals inside your mailbox every single day. Today we're going to be talking about something on the M16 and its introduction into Vietnam and what really gave it a, initially a reputation of being a bad rifle. You'll hear FUDs in the gun store talking about how the M16 and the AR-15 is just a trash rifle. It, you know, my, my uncle's friend Bob used one in Vietnam and it was garbage, but they do have a point somewhat and we're going to tell you exactly what happened. Years 1964, the Army starts to fill the M16. In 1965, it starts seeing a lot more action and in particular, it is involved in one of the first major conflicts of the Vietnam War, the Battle of La Drang Valley, where U.S. airborne troops and also another first being the first major helicopter assault in warfare ever are going into the field with the M16. They are surrounded, outnumbered, nearly overran. In the end, they end up winning the battle. And a lot of that had to do with the capability of the M16 rifle, with its high capacity, its ability to accurately hit the target with very low recoil. It really gave the troops an advantage, but there were some major issues. So what we're really getting at is primarily the bolt carrier group. When Eugene Stoner designed the M16 and the AR-15 rifle, he had a chrome lining on the bolt carrier group. So if you look back to those early Vietnam days of the color videos and stuff, and you look, look at the rifle, pay special attention to the bolt carrier, you'll notice it's quite shiny. And what this did is it reduced the carbon buildup, increased lubricosity, and made the weapon function overall better. But there was a catch. See, the M16 was being manufactured by Colt, not by Armalite. So what Colt did, is they looked at Eugene Stoner's original design and they said, eh, this chromium process, it's uh, not unique to this gun, it's a licensed process from another company. So, well, we need to make more money off this gun, so what are we gonna do? Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll copy the chromium process. But Colt did not copy it as good as the licensed process. So what ended up happening was little chunks of the chrome lining that was on the bolt carrier would start to flake off. Hey, Ryan with Gun Coyote here, giving you a preview of an upcoming video. Going to talk a little bit about the rifle that we're going to be using. Well, rifles, really. If you like our content, make sure that you like and subscribe. But anyway, guys, the M14 service rifle is a video that we're going to be coming up with. Also, mostly known in the civilian world as the M1A, made popular by Springfield. So the M14 service rifle was designed late in the late 40s, early 50s. And what it was meant to do was to replace the M1 Garand, or Garand, however you want to say it, the uh, M2 and the M3 grease gun, as well as the BAR. So what they were trying to do is make a universal service rifle that was going to be able to fulfill the roles of a battle rifle, a squad automatic rifle, and a support weapon, uh, everything all in one. <laughs> Did it succeed at those? No, not really. It was a pretty terrible automatic weapon. 
But anyway, the M14 did see service through the 50s and through a pretty sizable portion of Vietnam and was replaced by the M16. Now it's often called America's shortest lived service rifle, but that is debatable. Yeah, was it the uh, service rifle for a long time? No, it wasn't. But what it did do is go on from the 50s through today and seeing uh, specialized use throughout modern combat, especially in the GWAT era when we started going to Afghanistan, we needed something to reach out longer range. The M14 came in, uh, they modernized it with the EBR chassis, which has its own quirks and so on. But the M14 is a great rifle. It is a tremendously fun rifle to shoot. And we're gonna bring out three of them for you in our upcoming video. We're gonna have Springfield's M1A SOCOM 16, uh, M1A uh, with the stainless uh, heavy barrel, uh, which is more of their loaded national match version. And we're also gonna have the standard synthetic stock 22 inch version of the gun as well. So looking forward to making that video for you guys. Hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about the M1A and we'll see you soon.